This battle was supposed to be a tremendous loss for General Joseph Hooker. But two months later, the army that he created won the Battle of Gettysburg. However, Hooker was not in command then, General Meade was. But this battle is going to be a very confusing battle to the combatants and to the people who study it. And as well, there's going to be a lot of movement in this battle. So, first of all, let's talk about what happens after the Battle of Fredericksburg. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, General Ambrose Burnside had one more chance, one more opportunity to go after Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. But he got bogged down in what's called the Mud March. After the Mud March, Burnside will resign his command of the Army of the Potomac and the Army will go to General Joseph Hooker. We are at the exact halfway point of the Civil War, right? Two years in, two years left to go. Um, in the North, there's, I guess, some frustration um, I guess you could say there's also a little bit of, of war weariness by some, you know, why can't we win this thing? All right, we have, um, we outnumber the South in a lot of different capacities. Uh, doesn't seem like we can get the job done, at least not in the East. Remember, everything we talk about today in this theater, there's another theater where progress is being made. While the Battle of Chancellorsville is occurring, Grant is crossing the Mississippi to get on the same side as Vicksburg. So a lot of times that gets forgot about, and that's obviously going to have big impact on the overarching state of the war. And for the Confederates out here, they had fought throughout 1862, had won numerous battles. Fredericksburg was their latest achievement in December of 1862. And you had asked about what is that connection to here? Well, the connection to here is that the Confederates not only fight at Fredericksburg, they stay after this battle. They start to fortify the Rappahannock River and try to make it that demarcation point between the Union Army to the north of us and the Confederate capital to the south of us. They entrench along the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg 20 miles south to Port Royal where the river becomes too wide and the tide's too high that anybody would ever think of bridging it in 1863. Engineers would catch up and do the James River in 1864, but 1863, this is still beyond the pale. Confederates entrenched from Fredericksburg upstream for 12 miles beyond where we are now with the idea that they would link into the confluence of the Rappahannock and Rapidan rivers so that the difficulty of crossing one river by the Union Army is now magnified to crossing two rivers. So the chances of somebody doing that are fairly negligible, at least in Confederate minds. So the Confederates have 32 miles of riverfront that they've entrenched as a deterrent against any Union advance south of that river. The Emancipation Proclamation was officially issued on January 1st. All right, that's got some big stuff going on. It's now the policy of the United States military to free enslaved people everywhere it goes. And those formerly enslaved people can now join the United States military, which by the end of the war will be 180,000 black soldiers and sailors, okay? so. Depending on how U.S. soldiers felt about that, it doesn't matter and how you feel anymore. This is policy. Some United States soldiers don't necessarily agree with that policy. They voiced that during the winter preceding uh, this battle. Um, but it's something that's now being brought to the forefront, have to be thought about whether you like it or not. Um, the soldiers, specifically that are in this army of the Potomac, have been having... Um, a rough last couple of months, right? The Battle of Fredericksburg is going to be difficult to come back, uh, after because, well, you sit around your winter camp for a few months and you think about that battle and what did it accomplish. And while the soldiers themselves, I think, felt very proud about how they acquitted themselves, they were they did everything they were asked at Fredericksburg. It wasn't for a lack of effort, but mm, the leadership let us down and we had bad luck. And geez, those Confederate uh, positions were just too impregnable. Um, so you play that out in your mind for the last few months. If it's impossible to feed the Army of Northern Virginia, 
How easy is it to feed the people? The army gets priority. So if you're struggling to feed them, how's it look to the people of the Confederacy? Grim. Grim is a good word. Bread riots. Yes, in fact, in the spring of 1863, the people are rising up in frustration and anger because they are unable to get the simplest staples of their diet. There are bread riots in March of 1863 in the capital. So, grim is a good word to use with that. Now, what's it look like as they have to deal with a bigger concept? The spring of 1863 is the first major campaign we're going to see after Lincoln has issued the Emancipation Proclamation. How do Southerners, Confederates, white Confederates, react to that? How do they perceive that? Existential threat. Existential threat is what I'm hearing in front. What do you guys think? Loss of a resource. Loss of a resource? In fact, uh, a lot of the entire Southern Confederacy's economy is based off of a workforce of enslaved people. And the United States has just targeted that as a military target to remove that as a staple in resistance to federal authority. So, how do Confederates react to this existential threat, this crisis? What's that? There'll be no more exchanges, there'll be no more quarter. Excellent point. In fact, May 1st, 1863, 160 years now, is not only the opening gambit of the Battle of Chancellorsville, it is a day that the Confederate Congress passes an important piece of legislation called the Retaliatory Act. And its retaliation is specifically against the Emancipation Proclamation. The President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, had already told the people of the South that they would not recognize white officers or black troops from the United States Army. That white officers will be considered as inciting rebellion and they would be treated with capital punishment according to the local laws. And that the black soldiers that were captured would either be put back into slavery, whether they had been enslaved before or were free blacks, they would be enslaved now. Or they would be treated by the full prosecution of the law against slaves in rebellion. What is the maximum penalty? Death. Precisely. The Retaliatory Act today just said it's not about local authority prosecuting these soldiers. It is now Confederate authority that will determine the punishment for white officers and black soldiers. It would be the, the Confederate Army that will decide what that punishment should be. This war just got dramatically more intense. So big things are riding on the lines here. Southern perceptions are that everything is starting to fall apart at this two-year juncture. And that they have to be even more reactionary, stronger in their terms than ever before. It's a tough time to be around. 